On this edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at, this is a warning. This is not something someone who's in love with Jesus needs to fear. But this is a warning for those who are in a place where they're wanting to say, God, get out of my life. Get out of my life, God. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Get out of my marriage. Get out of my relationships. Get out of my business. Get out of my life. This is a warning for you. So I have some good news for you tonight, and I have some bad news for you tonight. I'm going to start with the good news. The good news is that God made you, and God don't make no junk. And God called you by name, He knows you by name, and He sent His Son Jesus to die for you, and because of His death, the gates of heaven are wide open. And everyone who believes in Jesus and accepts Jesus can enter into eternal life. As a matter of fact, Jesus right now is in heaven preparing a place in the Father's house for you, and He promised that He will come and bring you to Himself so that where He is, you may be also. That's the good news. The bad news is is that you have an enemy who wants to destroy you. You are in a spiritual battle, and you have an enemy who wants you to lose what Jesus has won for you by shedding His blood. And as a child of God, you have something which we call free will. You choose. You choose where you want to spend eternity. God desperately wants you to spend eternity with Him in heaven. That's what you were made for. He's so desperate, He sent His Son Jesus to die for you. That's how much He wants you to spend eternity in heaven, but He won't force you. You can refuse to be in a loving union with God for all of eternity because love is never forced. And the consequences of refusing God's love are terrible. Once a year, I feel I need to speak about the loss of eternal life, hell. John Paul II said priests should preach once a year about hell. Some priests preach about hell all the time. I try to follow John Paul II's advice because I like to talk about other things. It's not a fun thing to speak about, but there's three reasons I want to speak about the loss of eternal life tonight. Actually, four. Number one, we're going to be giving you ashes. And when we're giving you ashes, we say, remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. So we're kind of, why are we, going to, why are we remembering this? Why? Because we're made for eternal life. And let's not deny that there's two options. There's not just one option. Some people think, oh, we're all going to die and go to heaven. God is not going to force anyone to be in an eternal loving relationship with Him. There is a second option. And when we say remember, that's why we're telling, uh, reminding ourselves to remember. That's the first reason I want to speak about this. The second reason is, again, John Paul II said, preach and preach about this once a year. The third reason is because I love you. When you love someone, you're willing to tell them the news that other people might not want to tell them. And I think of myself as a teenager when I was going through a rough time, when I turned to atheism, when I was making bad decisions. I wish a priest from the pulpit would have lovingly warned me that my eternal salvation was at stake with the decisions I was making. I never heard that strong message. It would have been a hard message to hear, but I wish I would have heard it at the right time. I never heard it. And then the fourth reason I want to speak about this tonight is because I'm concerned about my own salvation. You see, Jesus spoke a lot about hell. And for me not to speak about it, I worry if I can get to heaven if I don't speak about what Jesus spoke about. It's like the prophet. Jesus told the prophets, you tell them what I tell you to tell them. If you speak my word and they don't listen, they're responsible. If you don't speak my word, guess who's responsible? The prophet. And so again, I speak also in, 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 without a concern for my own salvation. We need to know the truth. I want to begin with a few scriptures. Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 10, he says, A thief comes only to steal and slaughter and destroy. Jesus is speaking about the enemy. The enemy wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. But Jesus says, I came so that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Those are the two options. Do you want the life 
Jesus gives, or do you want to go with the enemy who wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy? Let there be no question in your mind. Let there be no confusion. The devil hates you. He might tell you, oh, let's, let's have fun. I want you to be happy. I want you to have fun. He's a liar. He wants to destroy you. He wants to ruin you. He hates you. So you better choose wisely who you're going to go with. In, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter says, Be sober and vigilant. Your opponent, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Again, brothers and sisters, we're in a battle. Every day is a battle. We have Jesus on our side. We have his power. We have his spirit. And we better make use of it because, again, we have an enemy who prowls like a roaring lion. In John, uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus says, Go into the whole world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Do you believe in Jesus? Good. You'll be saved. If you don't believe in Jesus, again, Jesus is clear. And then finally, one last scripture. In Revelations, this is, this is the last couple uh, verses, the last couple paragraphs of the Bible. I always tell people, read, read the conclusion because everything is summarized there. There's a beautiful description of heaven, but there's also a description of what will come to those who renounce, who reject Jesus. It, it says in Revelation 20, verse 10, The devil who had led them astray was thrown into the pool of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And in verse 14, Then death and Hades were thrown into the pool of fire. The pool of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the pool of fire. And so again, Scripture is abundantly clear. Again, we ha- I have to repent on, on behalf of us preachers. We tend to talk about the nice stuff all the time. And again, I love talking about the nice stuff. But we must preach the whole gospel, which includes the reality of our eternal salvation and, if we reject God, of our eternal damnation. We need to preach that clearly. And again, I do this once a year. Those of you who only come to church once a year and who are here tonight, you should come to church more often, okay? (laughs) Now, I want to read to you from St. Faustina. Rather than give a homily about hell, I'm just going to let St. Faustina tell you. She's a canonized saint in the church. This comes from her diary, which has been um, approved by the church. And she was shown hell, and she describes it. Now, the rodeo is going on right now, isn't it? So some of you are wearing your boots. That's good because you're going to be shaking in your boots when you hear this. Get ready. And again, I remind you, God loves you. He will not send anyone to hell unless that person wants to go there. This is not something someone who's in love with Jesus needs to fear. But this is a warning for those who are in a place where they're wanting to say, God, get out of my life. Get out of my life, God. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Get out of my marriage. Get out of my relationships. Get out of my business. Get out of my life. This is a warning for you. I, Sister Faustina Kowalska, by the order of God, have visited the abysses of hell so that I might tell souls about it and testify to its existence. Let me point out, St. Faustina's whole diary, big, thick diary, it's all about God's mercy. Hardly anyone has written so eloquently about the love and mercy of God. St. Faustina, she doesn't like to talk about this either. She, she, she speaks about this under the order of God. She says, The devils were full of hatred for me, but they had to obey me at the command of God. What I have written is but a pale shadow of the things I saw. But I noticed one thing, that most of the souls that are there are those who disbelieved that there is a hell. She goes on, Today I was led by an angel to the chasms of hell. It is a place of great torture. How awesomely large and extensive it is. The kinds of tortures I saw. 
The first torture is, that constitutes hell is the loss of God. That's the greatest torture of hell, not being with God. The second is perpetual remorse of conscience for all of eternity to know that you made the wrong decision. You made a big mistake. The third is that one's condition will never change. The fourth is the fire that will penetrate the soul without destroying it. A terrible suffering since it is a purely spiritual fire lit by God's anger. The fifth torture is continual darkness and a terrible suffocating smell. And despite the darkness, the devils and the souls of the damned see each other and all the evil, both of others and their own. The sixth torture is the constant company of Satan. The seventh torture is horrible despair, hatred of God, vile words, curses, and blasphemies. These are the tortures suffered by all the damned together, but that is not the end of the sufferings. There are special tortures destined for particular souls. These are the torments of the senses. Each soul undergoes terrible and indescribable sufferings related to the manner in which it has sinned. There are caverns and pits of torture where one form of agony differs from another. I would have died at the very sight of these tortures if the omnipotence of God had not supported me. Let the sinner know that he will be tortured throughout all eternity in those senses which he made use of to sin. I am writing this at the command of God so that no soul may find any excuse by saying there is no hell or that nobody has ever been there so no one can say what it is like. How terribly souls suffer there. Consequently, I pray even more fervently for the conversion of sinners. I incessantly plead God's mercy upon them. O oh my Jesus, I would rather be in agony until the end of the world amidst the greatest sufferings than offend you by the least sin. We will continue with the teaching by Father Mark in just a moment. The Food for Life ministry is only made possible by the financial donations from you, our viewers. We ask that after the program, you prayerfully consider a tax-deductible financial donation to help us continue this Catholic television ministry. To save postage, you may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. Thank you for your prayers and support. And now back to Father Mark Goring. Brothers and sisters, if there is anyone here who has in some way rejected God, turned away from God, or is beginning to go down a path distancing yourself from God, I urge you, in the name of Jesus, get back on the right path. Give your life to God. Give your life to Jesus. Trust in Him. Surrender to Him not only to avoid eternal damnation, but so that you may have life. God, your Father, wants you to be happy. If you follow Him, if you do His will, He will give you life, joy, peace, and freedom. You know that. And so today and tonight, make that decision. Surrender to God. Surrender to Jesus and He will grant you your heart's desires, and you will spend all of eternity with Him in heaven. For an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Mark Goring on This is a Warning, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. When you write, ask for an audio CD or video DVD of program 1781. 
On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at life or death. You choose. Again, the whole concept of today. Some people say, oh, that was like hundreds and thousands of years ago. They're not talking about today. No, today, the Lord says to us every day, today I set before you life and I set before you death. You choose. And we need to choose every day. just wanted to take up, take this opportunity to, to clarify a misunderstanding. Most people would say that God can do anything. Well, I have to tell you today that that's not true. There's one thing God can't do. And that is, he cannot resist a humble heart. He can't not forgive a humble heart that turns to him and ask for forgiveness. And in that, we see the vulnerability of God. Because of that one thing God can't do, God is vulnerable. But God leads by example. In a certain sense, God leads from a position of vulnerability. God leads from a position of weakness. And so we follow God's example when we forgive. That we express the very vulnerability of God when we forgive. And so God is calling us to lead from a position of weakness. We see this in the life of Jesus. Have you ever said to yourself, what was the Father thinking? when he sent the son and he asked the son to come to earth with no temporal resources, no economic power, no uh, family stature, no political status. And he said, son, now go tell the world that you're my son. So that's what I call leading from a position of weakness because We know the reception that Jesus received. Would we expect any other reception? And yet, nevertheless, Jesus came. And he put his own um, status aside, as Philippians 2 tells us. He laid his glory by. He led from a position of weakness. He placed himself in a position of vulnerability. And now he's asking us to do the same. Do you have situations in your life? Are there people that God's calling you to love? And odds are pretty good. You're not going to get a lot back. As a matter of fact, your outreaches might be spurned. Are there people in your life where, yeah, there's just no ROI, no return on investment in that relationship, and yet something inside of you Something inside your heart knows that, no, Jesus wants me to love this person. Jesus wants me to reach out. And you look at yourself and you look at the resentments you have and you know it's not right to resent them. And you just feel so weak. You just feel that you cannot rise to the task. The fact that you have those resentments and the fact that you are equally called to love means that you are leading from a position of weakness. You do not have what you need to get the job done. So here's the other beautiful reality. Because of your relationship with Jesus, because you are a son, or because you are a daughter, because you are a full-fledged member of the kingdom, you are a prince or a princess, that you have all of the kingdom of God behind you 
that despite your brokenness, your weakness, your resentment, your judgments, behind you, you have the backing of the kingdom of God. Not only that, Jesus says the kingdom of God is in you. And so, you are part of this royal family, the family of the kingdom of God. You are, you are royalty. And yet, you have this pronounced weakness. Now, do we, have, do we have an analogy in our daily lives where we see people that we admire because they're royalty? Some of those folks have character issues and some don't. But isn't there something about royalty that nevertheless, character issues or not, we are charmed by them? How much more our father is charmed with us. He looks at us and says, son, my daughter. And he sees our weakness and he goes, I don't care. I am with you. That everything in my kingdom is yours. Remember the story of the prodigal son? Remember what the father says to the son who was faithful to him? And that the, the, the son who was faithful to him was jealous that the father was going to have a party for the son that returned. And the father with great love says to the son, son, everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. And so when we look at what we're called to and we look at what we have to offer, if we are honest with ourselves, we don't have what we need. But because we're royalty, We've got the resources of the king behind us. And because we're royalty, we can look at our weakness without condemnation. I'm a prince. I'm a prince of a guy. You're a princess. God is charmed by you. There is no condemnation. We look at our weakness and we're condemnation free. We might feel convicted that we need to work on certain things. Fine. Our father will say, okay, son, we're going we're gonna to focus on this area in your life now. We're going to move you forward. Not that this is going to change my affection towards you. I'm charmed by you, my prince and my princess. But if you acknowledge your weakness, we can then work together. We can move forward. But if you, if you remain proud, you're not giving me anything to work with. And I so want to move you forward. Not because it has anything to do with my love for you. You know what it actually has to do with? It has to do with your freedom. You know that I made you free, right? God made us free. That's another thing, by the way, that, um, that God can't do. He's, he's, he can't force us to do things, right? He's given us our freedom. So the reason why he wants to move us from our faults is so that we can be free. I'll give you an example. How free would you be if someone could say something to you and it never bothered you? Imagine if you could be a resentment-free person. You could declare your own personal environment as resentment-free. How free would you be? And the father says, sweetheart, son, I want to bring you to this place where people can say something to you that's maybe critical. And, and you're like, oh, I'm okay because God loves me. I'm a prince. God's going to take care of everything. That's where the Lord wants to take us. We, we're at this place where we, we just naturally live this divine sonship, this divine daughtership, feel totally loved by the Father. We look at our weakness and go, no problem, Daddy's going to help me. Daddy's moving me forward. And it's all good. Father, we just, we thank you. You know, frankly, Father, we have no idea the inheritance we have in you. But we so want to understand what it means to be your prince, to be your princess, to understand what it means to have the kingdom of God in us so that we can freely, without condemnation, be honest about our weakness so that you as our Abba, as our Papa, and as our Daddy can move us forward to a new and wonderful place of freedom, again, without fear, without condemnation. So, Father, we ask you, to stir up this grace that we know is in us, but burst it forth, Lord, so that we can love you with our whole hearts. In Jesus' name I pray.
Amen. We would like to extend a sincere note of thanks to you, our viewers, who have so faithfully supported Food for Life through these many years, through your prayers, through your financial gifts to the ministry. Today I want to read a few comments from viewers that we've received, and I think they'll bless you, and especially those of you who invest in this ministry through your prayerful and financial support, you'll see that what you do is really making a difference. The first viewer writes and says, I'm a Protestant, but I enjoy your comments on Food for Life. Your sincerity makes me believe that someday soon we may truly be one. Another viewer writes and said, says, You have been such a blessing to me. Terrific Bible teaching, a beautiful balance of the Word, the heart and the mystery of God. You've given me great hope for spiritual renewal in the church and a mature, spirit-filled lay ministry. Another viewer writes and says, I want to thank you for your Food for Life program. You inspire me to be a stronger Christian and more devout Catholic. You help me in many ways, opening my mind and heart to a fuller personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And one final comment I'd like to read to you comes from a viewer who writes, Thank you for your Catholic television program. You represent the faith in such a way that proclaims the good news and love of God and salvation available in Jesus and the power to live the Christian and Catholic life through the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank these viewers for taking the time to write. And again, I thank you for the support that you lend to this ministry. You know, many people are surprised or they see Food for Life and they think, oh, they get some lump sum of funding and they're taken care of. That's not the case. We have no one organization or source from where our, our funding comes from, but it's through people like you. People like you make the difference and allow us to stay on the air and to proclaim the good news. If you feel that Food for Life has been a blessing to you, perhaps you could prayerfully consider a one-time gift or even consider becoming a monthly partner with us. We also have many convenient ways to give. We have pre-authorized donation plans. I can send you that information. And it can make giving very, very convenient and very easy. If Food for Life has been a blessing to you, if you see that the impact that it's making on people's lives is important, please write to us at Food for Life. We'd like to hear from you. For an audio CD or video DVD of today's ministry, we invite you to write to us. When you write, mention the program number 1781. And today's topic, Father Mark Goring on, this is a warning. Food for Life is a nonprofit Catholic charity funded only by donations from viewers. To help us continue this Catholic television ministry, please send your tax-deductible donation to Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. To save postage, you may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. We ask you to consider a regular monthly donation, either by post-dated checks or through our website, to help us continue the Food for Life ministry. If you have never donated before, we ask that you make your check payable to Food for Life. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at life or death. You choose. Again, the whole concept of today. Some people say, oh, that was like hundreds and thousands of years ago. They're not talking about today. No, today the Lord says to us every day, today I set before you life and I set before you death. You choose. And we need to choose every day. We would like to thank you for your financial support of the Food for Life television ministry. Food for Life is funded only by viewers like yourself. We have no commercial sponsors. Your tax-deductible donations help pay for production of the program, pay the television station for the time that the program is on the air, and pay for the mailing of our monthly newsletter. Thank you again for your support of this Catholic television ministry.